ahead and take your copy of God's Word and open with me to Psalm 98. Psalm 98, we're going to begin by reading the first three verses. Sing to the Lord a new song, for He has done marvelous things. His right hand and His holy arm have worked salvation for Him. The Lord has made His salvation known and revealed His righteousness to the nations. He has remembered His love and His faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Father, we pray today that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When we think of Christmas passages, we tend to think of those passages in the beginning of Luke's gospel or Matthew's gospel that speak of the birth of Jesus. We don't always think of the Psalms. In fact, right, the Psalms were written sometimes centuries before Christ was born. And so we don't often read a Psalm and think this is about Christmas. Maybe, though, if we were to paraphrase this Psalm for you, at least in the words of the great hymn writer Isaac Watts, you might pick up on its Christmas theme. Joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth receive her king. My guess is you know the rest. One of our greatest Christmas songs, Joy to the World, is based not on any passage from Luke or Matthew, but instead is based here on Psalm 98, a psalm written hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. Uh, Isaac Watts was a precocious little boy. Uh, he was really in many ways a genius. He had learned Latin by age five, Greek by age nine, French by age 11, and Hebrew by 13. We won't ask you how many of those languages you knew by 13. As he grew up, he really, like a lot of teenagers, grew frustrated with the music they were playing at church. Does that sound like a modern theme? This was in the 1700s, my friends. And so he couldn't always understand what the songs were about, so he decided to start writing his own. He was a person who knew the scriptures inside and out. So while his songs don't always repeat the scriptures verbatim, which is what most of the music, church music in that day did, he takes the themes of scriptures and turned them into some of our most beautiful hymns. He wrote, when I survey the wondrous cross, Another's hymn, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed, and of course, Joy to the World. This hymn could be considered a Christmas song, is really in many ways unique to our own country. It, it really is a Christmas song here in America. If you go to other countries and other parts of the world, they sing the hymn, Joy to the World, all year long. But in America, with many of our uh, more liturgical brothers and sisters in Christ, there are three Psalms, Psalms 96, 97, and 98, for those churches that kind of read the same passages every year, that those Psalms in, most, in many American churches got read at Christmas over and over and over again so that they have come to be known as the Christmas Psalms. Certainly Isaac Watts' rendition of Psalm 98 fits the themes of the season. It captures really the great truths of Christmas, even if it doesn't speak specifically of the Christmas season. It tells us that God is for us. It reminds us that God is with us. And it holds out the great hope of all believers that Christ shall come again. The first one of those is this simple truth that we all long to hear. The God who made the heavens, the God who made us, He is for us. This psalm tells us in verse 1 that we are to sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. That is, God is for his people. He has worked to bring about redemption and salvation for those that he loves. Within the church, this is almost a cliche, right, to say that God loves us and God is for us. But not everyone in the world uh, believes such a thing. People find themselves uh, wondering whether or not there is a God, and if there is a God, whether or not he is for us. We talked a few weeks ago about how uh, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, and if 
we, we had trouble getting a clear night here, but if you were visiting a friend and you went out and you looked at the Christmas star uh, when Jupiter and Saturn came together and, and you looked up into the heavens, you, you may wear it very well because you are a believer, uh, looked in that moment and saw the glory of God. You may, if you're up north, ponder the infinite designs of a snowflake, or if you've ever read anything about just the complexities of the human eye, it can leave you going, ours is a great and mighty and creative God. Yet, nature can send mixed signals, can't it? I mean, just as there is beauty in nature, so too is there uh, an amazing amount of violence and hardship I remember years ago when John Curtis was a little boy, he loved penguins. And so we watched that documentary, The March of the Penguins. Anyone remember that? And it was a really amazing documentary to get to look at these animals that really most of us only get to see in a zoo. And, and some of the amazing gifts that God has given these creatures called penguins. And yet there's also great, great, uh, you know, really heartache. Because here you have the mom and the dad who, who will march one at a time, really uh, long, long ways to the ocean to, gr to go and hunt for food and bring it back to the babies. But here's the thing, if either the mom or dad is caught by a sea lion or a killer whale or, or anything else, that baby will not make it because the mom and dad have to take turns. If either one of them is killed, the baby will freeze to death in the harshness of the Antarctic. It's a tough movie to watch with your kids. You know, we get into that as parents. We, we watch these movies and, and then we get into them and we think a documentary about penguins is safe. And then you get into it and you think, well, this, this is a lot sadder than I thought this was going to be. And so is the world we live in. So that we know when we look out into the heavens, when we look out into nature, yes, the heavens declare the glory of God, but because of the brokenness of this world, it proclaims a mixed message. It can leave us wondering whether or not God is for us. This year, 2020 of all years, with, remember, if you go all the way back to this time last year, it started with fires in Australia, and we had all other manner of disasters, earthquakes and hurricanes. And, of course, we always think of big disasters, but what has upended our whole world is a tiny little virus that we cannot see with our own eyes. Yes, the heavens declare the glory of God, but this world also proclaims the brokenness that sin has brought into this world and leaves us wondering sometimes whether or not God is really for us. Does God care for us? In the Christmas story, God gave us his forever answer. In the coming of Jesus, in the manger, in his living, his life to show us what true life looks like, in his giving of himself on the cross, God has spoken a forever yes over your life and mine. Karl Barth, the great 20th century theologian, uh, was a German minister during World War II. Talk about something shaking your confidence in the goodness of God. In fact, many of his peers gave up on God altogether. And yet after the war, uh, Bart, who was really raised in a, a liberal church tradition that really thought that really the, the measure of one's faith were really, you know, how our, our human thoughts about God would really begin to read the book of Romans. And he was captured not by human beings' thoughts about God, but rather God's thoughts about human beings so that he said it is not the right human thoughts about God which form the content of the Bible, but the right divine thoughts about men. That is, the Bible, God's word, is not so much what you and I should think about God so much as it is the declaration of the good news of what God thinks about us us, that even though we are sinners, even though we are people who have strayed from God, God loves us and is for us, and he has made a way for our sins to be forgiven. As one writer put it, the stunning point of Christmas is that God considered our needs and the worth of the, his relationship with us to be sufficient cause to go through the trauma of trading places. Maybe you haven't thought about the incarnation in a long time. Maybe it's just something that because we talk about it in church, it's just something you think, sure, that's great. But, but think about that. The God who spoke the heavens into being loved you enough to become an infant who could not speak. 
We've all been so frustrated this year wearing masks. It even happened before church this morning. We're, we're trying to practice all of the good habits that folks are asking us to practice. And so we're trying to greet one another with our mask on. And there was at least three or four of you where I'd said something and you looked at me like, I didn't catch any of that, Pastor. And then you said something back to me and I went, I didn't catch any of that either. And it's frustrating, right? Because we want to be able to communicate with each other. Can you imagine that the God whose very words brought existence into being was a toddler at one point. You've had toddlers in your life, right? That toddlers are, are aware enough of the world to know what they want, but their verbal skills have not yet quite, 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 quite yet caught up. Neither have the pastors apparently, right? And it can be frustrating to be with a two-year-old who is trying to tell you what they want, but you cannot understand them. Friends, God encountered that level of frustration on our behalf, and even more so, went so far as to give himself on the cross that we might be saved. Mary picks up the marvelous plan of God's when she is given the good news that she will bear a son. In Luke chapter 1, verse 54, she says, God has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. God is merciful towards us. And the good news that Jesus would come to proclaim is that he wasn't just going to be merciful to Israel. He was going to be merciful to all the peoples of the earth. No matter where you are from, what you have done, or, or, where, uh, or who you are, God is for you. This is why the psalmist invites not just Israel, but the whole earth in verse 4. To shout for joy to the Lord. Joy to the Lord burst into jubilant song. God's salvation is for all people. Joy to the world indeed. So God is for us is one of the things that this psalm declares. But we want really even more than that. I know it sounds greedy, but, but we want to know more than that God is just for us. Because in really at the depths of our hearts, we, we want more than a benevolent dictator who sits on high and who is never really seen. We, we want a God who is close by, a God who we can have an intimate relationship with us, a God who is not just for us in a general sense, but a God who is for us in a very intimate sense, a God who is with us. And the psalmist in verse 2, makes it clear God is close by. He says, the Lord has made, known, has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. God, God hasn't just stayed far off. He has brought his salvation to us. In, in the ancient world, in the Old Testament days, that meant that God had given us his law, that we knew who he was and what he wanted from the giving of the law. And in many passages in the Old Testament, we, we gain a sense of who God is from looking at his creation, that, that God makes many of his qualities known simply by the glories of creation. This is why Paul would say in the beginning of his letter to the Romans, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. What Paul meant was that when we look at the world, when we look at the heavens, the very fact that there is something rather than nothing should lead us to the conclusion that there is one who is greater than we, one who made the world, one who made us. Paul is saying in theological terms that really just, just by paying attention to the universe, we should understand that there is a transcendent, I know that's a big word, transcendent God, a God who is other, a God who is bigger than we are, a God who is beyond our imagination. But to know that God is not just far off, but that he is also drawn near, requires more than creation like we noted earlier. It requires an actual self-revealing from God, that God, who is completely other than us, he has to make himself known in order for us to to know him intimately. We cannot on our own get to God. God must come to us. For us to draw near to God, we need a God who's willing to move in and be close by. A God who longs to have an intimate relationship with his creation. And friends, it just doesn't get any more intimate than a baby, does it? 
I wish we had a baby dedication today. It's one of my favorite things to do as a pastor when people say, what do you love about being a pastor? But one of the things I love are baby dedications. You know, you get to walk in and hold a baby and that's just joyful anyway. I love babies. But then I also get to look, at, I get to enjoy you being fools. I, I mean, some of you, right? You're the coolest guys out there. You're big, you're strong, you're tough. You know, you got it all together. But let me bring a baby by you and you've got the Gucci Gucci gooing going on. And, and right, you just look silly. There's something about a baby that helps lower all of our defenses. There's something about a baby that helps us just to go, that, you know, that, that, that helps us to be open to the possibilities of life. And the Bible teaches us that God became just that, to lower our defenses so that we might draw near to him without perhaps even realizing we had done so. Of course, that baby would grow up to talk and to walk and to eat taught all of those things by a man and his wife and would grow up to teach us how to live. In a day of the internet, we're learning new ways to, to learn things. You know, my son and I just built a computer this week. It was his Christmas present. He asked for it, all the different parts, and we were putting it together. And I used to do this with my grandfather as my son reminded me decades ago. So I didn't remember all the finer points, but we've got a wonderful thing. It's not just that you have the manuals that you open up and you can't understand a word they say. Now because of the internet, what do we have? YouTube, YouTube. So we can find someone out there who doesn't just tell you how to do something, they show you how to do it. We can learn all manner of things in this way. I mean, it's just easier, right, when somebody shows us how to do something. And this is true in all of life. C.S. Lewis talked about this fact ages ago when he said, you know, we, we learn by someone showing us how to do something. And he talked about learning to write. And he says all of us at one time or another, when we were learning how to write, one of the adults in our life, a teacher or a parent, came and put their hand around ours in order to show us how to move the pen. He says, here's one of the great conundrums of life, that the thing you and I most need to learn how to do is repent. But how does a perfect God teach repentance? Here too is one of the great mysteries of the incarnation, that God didn't just draw near in order to show us that he loved us. He actually took on our frailty, and in a mysterious way, took on our sinfulness so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's how Paul put it in his letter to 2 Corinthians. It's not so much that Jesus repented, but in taking our sin upon himself, in humbling himself to death on a cross, he taught us really the way to salvation, that we too were to humble ourselves, die to self, confess our sins, that we might be crucified with him so that we might also partake in his resurrection. Friends, Christmas and really the whole life of Christ teaches us that we have a God, no matter how big, no matter how unimaginable, who nevertheless is both for us and for us with us so that we might be saved. Those two things alone are enough reason to shout for joy all of our days. But the psalm reminds us there is one more part of God's story of salvation, that someday the God who came and dwelled among us will come again and set all things right. The psalmist imagines that day in verses 7 through 9. He says, let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing, for, sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. The good news of Jesus Christ is not just that he came in a manger so that we might know God is with us. It's not just that he died on the cross that our sins might be forgiven to know that God is for us. It's also that he will come again and set all things right. We need that news every day of our lives, but perhaps now as much as any. It's a little bit like remembering the, the, the fact that, you know, I don't know about you, but I am more hopeful today 
than I was just a few months ago simply because there are images on the TV screen of people getting a vaccine. Anybody felt that? You know, my day-to-day life really hasn't changed that much. We're still having to take precautions. We're still having to stay separated from one another. We're still having to wear masks. In fact, in many ways, day-to-day life has not changed, but there is a spark of hope within us because we have seen that something has happened that we believe will change the future so that we can envision a day when we'll be beyond all of the challenges of this year. Realistically, not all of the challenges of this year, but at least all these COVID challenges. In much the same way, but really a greater way. The coming of Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection serve for us as, as, as the signpost of the day when Christ will come again and everything will be made well. How can we trust that that will happen? Because Christ has already overcome the grave. Christ has already defeated death. Paul in the book of Colossians says he is the firstborn from the dead, that because of his life, his life post-death, we can trust the end is coming and it will be good. All those who have put their faith in him. I pray that every time we celebrate Christmas. We will remember not just what God has done, but what he will do. And with that, we will join Isaac Watts and all the countless saints who have been transformed by God's grace by singing with all our hearts, joy to the earth, the Savior reigns, let men their songs employ. Father, we are so grateful for the good news of Christmas. It's not just good news on December 25th. It's not just good news in December. It is good news every day of our lives. That, Lord, no matter how troubled we are, no matter how difficult our circumstances, we can know you are a God who is for us. You are a God who is with us. And you are a God who is coming again. Because of that, Lord, we can face any hardship because we trust in you. Not not because we think we have it together, but because, Lord, we trust that you are in control and that, Lord, you will keep your promises to us. That, Lord, one day, all of the troubles we face, they'll be distant memories. And, Lord, in anticipation of that day, we worship you with much joy. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.